So yeah, if you don't know me, I'm Nick Paling uh, from West Country Rivers Trust. Um, actually, I presented at the uh, last Simap User Group meeting, whenever it was, four, four, four years ago. And uh, the subject of my presentation at that time was something to do was to do with surface flow index, which is one of the outputs, as you're probably all aware, of the Simap uh, modelling framework. And um, at that time, I'd just become really obsessed with surface flow index and how wonderful it was because we'd done a whole load of testing. Um, with the Tamar Catchment Partnership at the time. And actually, um, it, it's a brilliant way of visualising uh, hydrological connectivity in a, in a landscape. Um, and actually, as because of that, and because the partnership and all the farmers and everyone had bought into it so strongly, um, the surface flow index became a, 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 a fundamental pillar, if you like, in our ecosystem services mapping method. Or, uh, and as Michelle mentioned in her talk, it, it still, to this day, is a critical part of everything we do. If you want to understand how water is moving over the surface in a landscape, then um, it's a brilliant way of doing it, especially considering that it's free, especially considering that it's easy to explain to normal people, um, and especially because it's so bloody good at predicting where wet bits of ground are and where water and flows and accumulates. And actually, this presentation is uh, perhaps not a surprise to you, but uh, it, it's, it's not a surprise to me. Um, Again, I'm going to be talking about surface flow index again, rather than SIMAP in its full sediment uh, modelling, risk modelling uh, form. The first few slides are just to introduce you to the piece of work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, really, um, albeit um, funded by DEFRA for the last 18 months, um, and more recently uh, through DEFRA Urban Demonstrator projects. Um, the local action project um, was actually an urban ecosystem services mapping project. Um, we worked with DEFRA. <laughs> Um, and DEFRA Network, family, whatever we're supposed to call them, uh, Environment Agency, Natural England, NRW, and loads of other partners in order to do it. So um, that's just um, to tell you where, where this piece of work has come from. Um, we've got a catchy title and a, and a, a, a nice graphic which shows uh, what the project was about, but essentially it was about data and evidence, uh, using data and evidence to, in, to help engage with stakeholders in urban landscapes, trying to get them to understand issues around water management, uh, green infrastructure, and all of the benefits, or disbenefits, if, if I can use the word, that they experience in their lives at the hands of their local and catchment landscape and the green infrastructure that's in it. It's, the project was about communication, it was about engagement, it was about um, establishing and exploring local choices, priorities, ambitions, looking for funding for essentially suds and green infrastructure, um, valuing the benefits from natural capital, which obviously has to be on there these days, um, but there is a, a natural capital assessment uh, component of the project, really auditing what, what do we have in, a, in an urban landscape that provides ecosystem services benefits to human beings where they live, uh, and how, what benefits do they provide? Can we quantify those benefits? How, what's the source pathway receptor equation in terms of those benefits coming from their source to the people who actually benefit from them? So I won't dwell on this too long. What did the project produce? Well, this is where it gets a bit more interesting. Um, we did a comprehensive review of uh, environmental assets and natural capital in urban landscapes. Um, we developed a way of doing strategic assessment of uh, need or priority for delivering in urban landscapes. We developed a toolbox of interventions and we've undertaken detailed opportunity mapping for suds and green infrastructure. I should just go back. Bottom right hand corner, there's a website for the project and all of the outputs, basically all of the outputs and everything we did in the project has been handed over to the CABA National Urban Working Group. Um, that was the whole, always the intention. Uh, all of, everything is free, everything's available for anyone to use in the CABA community or, or beyond um, and everything we've done is available uh, there. So for Local Action Toolkit is basically, what, again, one of the foundation stones that the CABA Urban Working Group is using now to do what it's trying to do in terms of getting local groups empowered, working, delivering green infrastructure and suds in their local uh, patch. Just uh, one of our target, uh, on the opening slide, you, you may have seen it briefly when it was on there. Um, we worked in Leicester, we worked in Manchester, uh, we worked in the Thames Estuary area, which is what this is, um, and we worked in Newton Abbott in Devon as a small provincial town. Um, and those were our demo areas where we did this learning through doing participatory approach to try and get local catchment partnerships uh, engaged with this kind of approach. So this is just showing green infrastructure, natural capital in most of London, basically. And we've also developed um, uh, 12 indicators of ecosystem service benefits in urban <coughs> landscapes. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail, but suffice to say the wagon wheels um, have been mapped. This is Leicester. And this is our strategic tool that allows us to assess the experience of people living in urban landscapes 
Um, there's social, cultural, environmental and economic benefits assessed um, and we try to quantify how, how people benefit, what, they ben what the mechanism is that they, are, they experience that benefit and we use this to identify areas where people are not experiencing benefits. I mean, in Leicester, the, the Willow Brook subcatchment, which sits roughly there, as you can see from the wheels, um, even without going into the details, you can see that those people are not experiencing benefits to the level that other people are. So, again, a strategically very important place. Urban Toolbox, I won't go into, you can see it on the website, but essentially it's all the Suds and Green infrastructure interventions and um, fact sheets, again, looking at benefits and cost of implementation, cost of management, issues around feasibility that allow us to target those millions of case studies and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the project. What, what, why is the, what has this got to do with SIMAP? Once we'd developed the toolbox, we identified criteria that would allow us to map opportunities for the delivery of suds and green infrastructure in the urban landscape. So this is the Willowbrook area of Leicester. Sarah, in the back of the trust, thinks, always sees it as a little elephant. And now, I, and every time I look at it, I see, only see a little elephant. <laughs> is it a little trunk? Sorry. <laughs> That's a tangent. Um, so, we, so, for example, green roofs, amenity green roofs, or um, extensive green roofs, or intensive green roofs, as they're known. Um, there is a way of identifying opportunities to do green roofs, especially amenity ones, um, extensive green roofs. Um, you need buildings with flat roofs uh, if you're going to retrofit, or you need, um, obviously, to build buildings with largely flat roofs below five degrees, and we can map those opportunities. Opportunities for river restoration, culverted rivers, heavily modified water bodies, barriers to fish migration, the usual rivers trust kind of stuff. Opportunities for street trees um, based on width of pavement and uh, such things as that. Water storage, looking at opportunities for residential or commercial water storage interventions like water butts and um, rain gardens, soakaways and such like. And the critical drainage areas are shown uh, on here. Right, so that's the end of the preamble. Now, what I've got now is a series of slides that I'm just going to use to explain to you how we use SIMAP Surface Flow Index. And the, really the quest here is how do we identify opportunities for local groups and practitioners to deliver SUDS really on the ground, notwithstanding all those other interventions. And this is, um, shows Surface Flow Index. We've run a network index, Surface Flow Index here with uh, one meter LIDAR, um, which is obviously now available from the Environment Agency. We've actually run it at very high resolution with 25 centimeter LIDAR. We've also run SIMAP Network Index on drone-derived 5-centimetre uh, DM or, or surface model data as well, and it works brilliantly every, in every single arena to predict where water moves and flows across the surface. So we like this. We ran it. Um, you'll see in, in a second what it looks like in close-up. Um, but straight away, for me, as someone who works in the Rivers Trust and who's uh, worked in, in catchment partnerships, I'm looking at green infrastructure here and I'm seeing areas of really high hydrological connectivity uh, where water flows and accumulates if the ground is saturated or impermeable as it is in urban landscapes um, when a sufficient rainfall event occurs. And that gives us a, a heads up immediately to say actually they might be areas, candidate sites, where suds of some description could be implemented to try and hold water back in green or natural infrastructure for longer and therefore mitigate some of the risk that is clearly in this area for, from surface water uh, flood risk. So we did it because it was, it's free. We did it because the data is there. We did it to have a look and see. And we went to the Rivers Trust and Dave Johnson and we said, what do you think of this? And we said to DEFRA, what do you think of this? This is looking really interesting. And everyone said, yeah. That, and we went to the people of Leicester, including the Environment Agency, local flood people, um, Leicester City Council and Trent Rivers Trust. And everyone thought, this is really interesting. This could be really useful. But the general response was also, it's not, it's not the gold standard. What, what are we going to do because Leicester City Council, Trent, uh, Seven Trent Water and the, and the Environment Agency are all using something actually different. They're using local, what are called swamp models, surface water management plan models, and they're using the EA surface water risk model, and they're using some very, very sophisticated, uh, very expensive bits of kit to actually try and do this already. So we said, right, well, how does this perform when compared to those other models? And so working with Dave Johnson from the Rivers Trust, who had an urban demonstrator project, we were actually able to get some of those other models for this part of Leicester, in fact, for all of Leicester. Um, and so we were able to make the comparison. So obviously we did. 
Right. So very quickly, I'm just going to ex um, explain what these are. So this is the swamp model, oh, I should say. We focused in on this Northfields area. It's just one small area up at the top of here. It looks fairly insignificant, but it is a critical drainage area, and there is, uh, you'll see in a sec, there's some quite significant surface water flooding issues up there. And this is, this is that area there. This is the um, Leicester City Council swamp model. Um, it's a 2D, two-flow model, and this is what's called phase three. So phase three is not just a where are the puddles model, as I would call it. This is, um, actually includes the integration of surface water, water accumulation, but also the underground drainage network and the movement of water clearly from the surface down into the drainage network. So what you can see here is this is actually a model depth in a 100-year rainfall event for um, 10 centimetres, 10 to 30 centimetres and over 30 centimetres deep. It's basically a map of where puddles collect if it rains a lot. That's my layperson's summary. On the right, as a comparison, you've got the e Environment Agency Surface Water Flood Risk Map. Now, this is actually a pluvial model, which is derived from phase one of the surface water management planning process. And you can see it's more extensive. And the reason for that is because it doesn't include the underground drainage network. So it assumes, actually, that the ground is impermeable and the, un and the drainage network is overwhelmed. So there's a couple of interesting things straight away. You can see some surface water flood risk areas, and obviously to some significant depth. Um, and actually, we find that this model is actually derived from phase one of this model anyway, so they're actually kind of the same, same thing. So it's no surprise that they're quite similar. Now on the right, what we've got is the surface flow index from SIMAP run in, on one meter LiDAR data for exactly the same area. And so immediately you can make a comparison. How does SIMAP perform in terms of predicting where water accumulates in puddles? What else does SIMAP show? And I would argue that actually SIMAP's pretty good uh, at predicting where water accumulates in puddles. Bearing in mind this costs probably hundreds of thousands of pounds, and this costs to us no pounds, apart from my time, or Sarah's time to run it. There are some differences. Clearly there are some, in there are some areas where SIMAP's predicting something extra, and, and that is where SIMAP has the ability to predict where water flows across the surface. Um, and this doesn't do that, whereas SIMAP clearly does. This model actually has what's called velocity in it as well. So it actually will predict depth, volume of water. It will um, predict the velocity of flow within the flooding event as it occurs. And actually, this is much closer to what surface flow index shows. You can see in these, and this is a school playing field, and this is a local park. You can see that clearly this is showing that water is moving across the surface in these areas in a much more similar way to how surface flow index does. Okay. So this is a video. Um, this is created uh, from, the, from the, I'll play it again in a sec. We've got time here. And what we've got here, and I'll, I'll play it again in a second if I can. In purple, we've got this, which is surface flow index. And then over the top, we've got the actual four, uh, four hour rainfall event. This is a 200 year rainfall event occurring. And I put it in there because it, A, because it's fun doing a video. And also because you can see the flood event occurring, but by having sign up in the background, you can see what the surface flow index shows extra. And I think what I think what it shows is it very clearly shows not only where the water is accumulating, but where it's coming from. And from someone who wants to do suds, I think that's pure gold. You might not be aware, but there's a project called Suds for Schools, which Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust pioneered in London and other places. This is a school playing field. This is a park. The opportunity, the, the, the opportunity is clear. Um, when you look at this map, certainly the, the, this large flood area is clearly being derived from connectivity of water coming partly from the streets, but also from this green space. And certainly up here, a major contribution in terms of connectivity into this flooded area is from the school playing field. And that must be an opportunity to do something in terms of suds to hold that water in that school playing field for longer. So, I thought that was quite cool. So just to finish, I'm just going to show, zoom in on this middle area here because it also happened that Trent Rivers Trust are particular, were inspired by a, a pr presentation that was given by London Wildlife Trust. London Wildlife Trust are doing a project called Deep Have, which was inspired again from Oregon in America. 
and that is to go out and engage with people to try and persuade them to permeabilise or depave their front gardens. And Leicester City Council are very, very interested in front gardens. They're very interested in back gardens as well, but particularly um, in, in front gardens. So we had a look at this in more detail. So just zooming in, shameless use of Google imagery. We, we've actually looked at um, all sorts of commercial aerial imagery, and what it has often is buildings leaning to the side, and that makes it very difficult to classify the images, whereas Google aerial photography, albeit stolen, I admit, uh, by using a, the power of screen dump, um, is the buildings are straight. If you look at this area on, on commercial aerial photographs, often the buildings lean over to one side or the other, which means that they obscure the, the gardens. So anyway, here's, here's that area zoomed in, and there's the surface flow index showing, and this is where that area of huge surface water flood risk is, and straight away you start to see some really interesting things. Obviously the roads are connected, but there's an area here, there was a surface water flood uh, that was predicted here in the model. You can see that SIMAP predicts a breakthrough into the major main area, and other breakthroughs through from, but all sorts of water moving apparently all through in between houses and anyone if you talk to anyone who's had surface water flooding they often talk about water coming you know through their backyard and into their house and not into next door and not into next door on the other side so I think again I think SIMAPS it, this is um, again run on um, one meter uh, LIDAR data and we've just elevated buildings uh, just to make sure in this case that um, water flows around buildings but obviously as we know in the reality once the flood depth gets above 10 20 centimeters then the water doesn't even get perturbed by running through buildings. And that's when people get really upset. So th there you go. And then in relation to um, front gardens, we're able to extract all the front gardens from master map. And they are, they're all the front gardens. Some of them are front and, and back gardens, but that's just a, an analysis glitch. But th there are the front gardens in that area. And we classified very simply the, the, the aerial photograph just to pick out ones which, according to the image, were green or grey. So the green ones are over 50% green, and the red ones are uh, over 50% grey. So in terms of an opportunity, we've got a live problem, two areas of quite significant surface water flooding, in, in, in considering that there's also the drainage active, it still floods. We've got surface flow index showing how in giving us an indication of how that water is moving through the landscape and accumulating in those giant puddles. And suddenly we've got an opportunity to go out and actually do something. And Trent Rivers Trust are basically champing at the bit to get out there and knock on all these doors and say to people, you might not be aware down here that pe people just down the road are getting flooded every time we have a really big rainfall event. It, there is actually something you can do about it. You might be able to help if you permeabilise your front front garden. Well, that's just Good Town, Bad Town, which is just a graphic to explain all the suds and green infrastructure interventions that we talk about are on the good side and all of the crap that we have to live with every day is on the bad side. That's me. Thank you.